so quickly, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome, everyone. I'm Joshua Gordon. I'm the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this edition of the Innovation Speaker Series for 2021 and 2020 to 2021. Uh, I'm going to be introducing the speaker, Dr. Martin Paulus, in just a moment, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk. But before I do that, I just want to remind everyone that uh, that the Q&A function should be used to ask questions uh, of the speaker. You can enter them at any point during the talk. So if a question pops in your head, just throw it right down there, and uh, we'll get to the questions at the end. Uh, also, for everyone's knowledge, this is being recorded. So when Dr. Paulus wows you and you wish your friends and relatives could have seen or heard it, uh, stay tuned to the announcements when it's available uh, on the web for future consumption. With no further ado, I'm, I'm, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome Dr. Martin Paulus. He is the Scientific Director and President of the Laureate Institute for Brain Research, which is in uh, which is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's also the deputy editor of JAMA Psychiatry. At the Laureate Institute, Dr. Paulus focuses on using neuroscience approaches to develop better assessments for diagnosis and prognosis of mental health problems and to develop novel interventions that are based upon an increased understanding of the underlying neuroscience. He has published lots of papers, over 300 of them. He's been funded continuously with grants from our institute and others. And he's currently principal investigator in NIGMS COBRA grant to develop an infrastructure for young investigators to establish their research careers. Uh, with NIH competitive funding. He's also a member of the ABCD study, a really important member as the Laureate Institute is really one of the more productive sites in that regard. Uh, more recently, the Laureate Institute also has uh, started a longitudinal study to examine uh, the question of how those with anxiety and depression problems respond to the challenge of COVID-19. So just all over the map. But I know I know Martin uh, for two other reasons. One is that he's a real pioneer in the use of computational approaches to psychiatry, and he has really been uh, instrumental in, in, in me developing an understanding of, uh, particularly on the clinical end of things, how computational approaches can be used to increase our knowledge of and develop novel treatments uh, for psychiatry. And so if you're sick of hearing about computational psychiatry from me, you are uh, you have Martin, among others, to blame for that. Uh, the second reason is because he's an avid cyclist like myself. In fact, Martin is one of the few psychiatrists that I know uh, engaged in research and funded by the NIMH, other than myself, who has actually biked across the country, uh, and details of which we have shared over a many uh, cycling event when we get together for meetings, etc. We like to try to take an afternoon or so and do a ride together. So uh, for those reasons and more, uh, Dr. Martin Paulus is one of my favorites in, in psychiatry on the meeting circuit and to listen to, and I'm pleased to be able to give you all the opportunity to hear from him today. Martin, take it away. Well, thank you, Josh. That was a fantastic and really, um, I feel uh, 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 very excited about the introduction and all the nice things you said. And I'm also very excited for everybody who is uh, uh, online. I hope everybody is healthy in these uh, very strange times. Um, this is will be an online presentation, so I rely on you uh, putting Q and A's in uh, to the Q and A box, and I will try to get to them uh, during the talk. But if I can't, because maybe I'm a little tight on time, I will certainly try to get to uh, most questions at the end of the talk. So let me get right uh, into it. So I'm going to tell you today. A little bit about uh, sort of the decision-making aspect um, of computational psychiatry, both from an explanatory and a pragmatic perspective. Uh, and I will make it very clear what I mean by those two perspectives. But before we get to that, um, I want to just uh, basically tell you that I get royalties from writing about methamphetamine use disorder uh, from up to date, but uh, that won't be relevant really today because I won't be talking about methamphetamine use disorder. And as uh, Josh pointed out, uh, we are one of the ABCD sites for which we are funded, and then the NIGMS uh, funds the uh, COBRA awards uh, that are linked, uh, listed here. 
So uh, before I begin uh, and dive right in, I would like to give you an outline of the presentation today. Uh, there are really five parts uh, to the talk. First, I will outline my perspective on computational psychiatry, uh, what the basic approach entails, its opportunities, but also um, the challenges. Um, and um, oops. second, I will talk about a, a particular aspect of decision making, uh, which has not uh, received a lot of attention, but which is increasingly being considered by research groups around the world, and that's version-based uh, decision making, which is opposed to reward uh, or uh, based decision making. This will also give me the opportunity to compare and contrast uh, reinforcement learning approaches or value-based uh, uh, or value-based action selection from active inference-based uh, action selection. And then third, I will uh, give you specific examples of different computational approaches to delineate the process dysfunction in anxiety. Um, these approaches are based on reinforcement learning, uh, motor control framework, and on active inference. And uh, together, uh, basically, these approaches point to a common set of dysfunctions that we can observe in anxious individuals. And fourth, I'll give you an example of a pragmatic approach to computational psychiatry that uses model simulations to help integrate uh, uh, and generate novel assessments. Uh, in particular, I will talk about medication adherence and how it can be understood within the context of active inference. And finally, I uh, try to summarize it all and uh, leave you with a few uh, take home points. Okay, so let me go into the background of computational psychiatry. So in a, in a recent viewpoint, I argued that there's been a disconnect between stakeholder demands and research in psychiatry. Uh, computational psychiatry, from my perspective, um, has the unique opportunity to start with stakeholder demands, develop researchable questions, and apply relevant models. It's important to consider what the goals of these models will be. And specifically, uh, computation models can serve to build new mechanistic understandings of the disease processes that are based on empirical evidence and not on some heuristic musings of psychiatrists from over 100 years ago. Um, instead, what uh, computational psychiatry is trying to do is develop process models that are proposed hypotheses of the underlying uh, processes that generate the observed behavior. The goal is to refine these models by a direct model comparison and to arrive at a generating model that is both compact and accurate and a representation of the pathophysiology of adaptive and non-adaptive behavior. When generating explanatory models, it's important to consider the level of causality we can apply to uh, the experimental approach. In general, and uh, many of the studies that I will present, um, uh, many of the computational uh, psychiatry studies have been based on case control studies. The problem with case control, control studies is that they can't really arbitrate deep levels of causality. And that's mostly because there are many uh, confounding factors, uh, either observed or non-observed, that can contribute to the model differences, but that cannot be uh, uh, di differentiated from the disease process itself. Um, so the, the issue is, the goal for computational uh, psychiatry should be to create explanatory disease models, but that's not enough. It's important to uh, keep in mind that outcome measures and the models uh, need to provide actionable information, and that information needs to be distributed eventually uh, in, in a measurable impact to stakeholders. And then to the end of my talk, I will give an example of sort of a pragmatic approach to computational psychiatry. So it's important to emphasize that explanation uh, is a stakeholder demand. Patients, providers, and families want to understand why specific disorders emerge, what makes them wax and wane, and how specific intervention help to improve the disorders or might even lead to cures. Uh, in many ways, uh, the current explanatory framework in psychiatry is still based on relatively simple receptor pharmacology that dates back to the 1960s and 70s. 
we're still essentially telling patients about chemical imbalances that are supposed to be corrected by uh, our medications. The problem with this approach is that it's based on really limited evidence and that the explanatory depth is relatively shallow. That is, it does not give the patient or the family a deep understanding on how these uh, disorders actually emerge. But there are significant challenges in building explanatory disease models. First, uh, psychiatric disorders are fundamentally mental first-person experiences, which are difficult to translate into objective biological processes functions. Second, psychiatric disorders are ideologically complex, and complex in two ways. First, there's a many-to-one mapping of causes towards disease. And second, there's a one-to-many mapping where even simple genetic disorders can have profound heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous uh, clinical uh, uh, phenomenology. Third, we have to acknowledge that psychiatric disorders are not likely to be reducible to a single process dysfunction on any particular uh, level, but they're really uh, what Kendra has called pluralistic, involve multiple levels and are multi-causal. So it can help uh, to contrast what I would call the old approach uh, to brain uh, uh, to understanding the brain with the approach proposed by computational psychiatry. Uh, whereas in the old approach, the relationship between brain, behavior and brain was mostly based on correlations or association. That is the measure, uh, one measures both uh, behavior and neuroimaging and relate the two by a correlation uh, of task measures with the degree of activation, say. In comparison, uh, computational psychiatry seeks to build specific process models. These models are uh, fundamental process hypotheses of how the investigator thinks that the individual instantiates a particular behavior. Due to the fact that these models are built within a quantitative framework, they allow one to test among competing models to arrive at a model which uh, most likely account for the observed behavior. Thus, decomposing the behavior into processes enables one to arrive at a deeper uh, understanding of how, brain, how patterns of brain activation can be relate, related to observed or future behavior. Ultimately, the explanatory depth is encoded in the computational model that hypothesized the relationship. In a recent review uh, with Quentin Hoyes, uh, Michael Browning, and Michael Frank, we argued uh, that computational psychiatry views psychiatric conditions as dynamical systems, which is the result, uh, which is essentially the result of the complex interactions among, among multiple levels of analysis, which includes, as pointed out here, genes, molecules, cells, circuits, behavior, and symptoms, but also environment. The important aspect here is that the dynamical system can organize quite distinctly from the levels generated uh, 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 and generate reproducible, stable, and adaptive, as well as non-adaptive behavior. So ultimately, the program for uh, computational psychiatry is to quantify the characteristics of this dynamical system in terms of sets of rules and parameters that move the state of the system forward in time. Here's a view of how the system adapts to a changing environment. The basic idea is that behavior is generated by a latent uh, variable model uh, with a certain temporal dynamics. Here, the hidden variable uh, termed age evolves according to some dynamics, but is not observed. The observation here termed E are directly informative about age at some time point, but the extent to which they are informative about future time points depends on the dynamics of age. Learning rates, that is the parameters that determine how fast the system is changing, should reflect the changeability of learned association. The reward expectation of learners with a high um, versus a low learning rate are shown in the two uh, panels in the bottom here, whereas a, a learner with a high learning rate is better able to update uh, his or her expectations following changes in association um, uh, with the, with the in, in the volatile environment, the uh, learner with the low learning rate really never quite catches up to the changes in the environment. In comparison, 
when the environment is very stable, which is on the bottom right panel, uh, the learner with the low learning rate accurately estimates the underlying association with the expectation of the learner with uh, high learning rate being pulled away from the true value by chance outcomes. The bottom line here is it's important to recognize that the dynamics of the system as governed by the learning rate uh, may not be problematic per se, but can be adaptive or maladaptive based on the characteristics of the environment. That is whether the environment is volatile or stable. The majority of computational models are based on behavioral paradigms or tasks that are completed by individuals with different psychiatric conditions. However, there are significant challenges for task-based measures. Uh, a recent study by Russ Poldreich's group showed clearly that uh, questionnaire measures here indicated in this, uh, in this uh, red cloud and task-derived uh, measures here with this uh, blue cloud cohere amongst each other, but there's very little coherence between task and self-report measures. Moreover, a meta-analysis of test retest reliabilities of task and questionnaire-derived measures in uh, blue and yellow here on the right panel showed that task-based measures have typically, typically lower reliability than questionnaire-based measures. This is particularly important when we consider using these approaches um, to measure how behavior changes over time, say as a function of disease state or treatment intervention. In general, as shown uh, in, the, in the panel on the lower left, only half of the test retest variants can be accounted for by differences between individuals, meaning that uh, highly robust group level effects are accompanied by unreliable individual level differences. To, su uh, to summarize, there are two major challenges ahead. First, to connect behavior-based computational models to other levels of analysis, in this case, say symptom levels. And second, to develop more reliable models that can be used to monitor behavioral changes in individual over time. I'm hoping to show you some examples of that. This extends also to uh, the uh, neuroimaging level. We've recently extended uh, this uh, by doing a meta-analysis uh, that focused on self-report and uh, imaging findings. As can be seen in these bottom uh, uh, three panels, it turns out that correlations between these levels really are overestimated for small sample sizes. And they only really stabilize with having several hundred uh, individuals available uh, to compute these uh, correlations. And typically, they, stable, uh, they stabilize at a relatively low level. We estimate that uh, in this meta-analysis, the, the imaging uh, data could only explain about 4% of the uh, symptom data. So that uh, shows us that we still really have a long uh, ways to go. So there are several challenges for computational psychiatry ahead. First, we need to see that we need to identify generative process models that quantify the biological process dysfunction in psychiatric population. Second, in combination with latent variable approaches, we need to be able to better identify robust and reliable relationships across level of analyses. So uh, from a cell level or even below, all the way to a systems level. And then we also need to develop task and assessments that can arbitrate between competing computational accounts. So for example, between value-based versus inferential-based decision-making and eventually provide pragmatic prediction tools. And uh, as you can see from this, we're, we're very, very early in this uh, process. So in a recent review uh, focused on decision-making in psychiatry, I emphasized the importance of considering models that take into account uh, that many individuals are much more sensitive to aversion as a consequence of their behavior than to reward. And that computational models of aversion-based decision-making are just beginning to emerge. So just briefly uh, summarize what is aversion-based decision-making. So for example, an example who uh, an individual who chooses not to attend a party or a social gathering to reduce uh, social anxiety is an example of aversion-based decision-making. And it falls broadly under the rubric of avoidance learning. So you have, for example, active avoidance, which is when one selects an action to prevent the occurrence of an internal or external stimulus that is followed by an aversive event. Passive avoidance, when an individual takes an action when an antecedent stimulus occurs. 
an, an escape response, which is a consequence of the aversive uh, event, or avoidance behavior, which is action selection to forego the exposure of an aversive condition stimulus. Within the value-based framework, an individual is assumed to, to be in a certain state that has a certain value. Um, and, uh, and that derives from two sources. The value of the stimuli that are associated with that state, which have been termed Pavlovian stimuli, and the action that have uh, led the individual to uh, find him or herself in that state, uh, which are called instrumental action. So a generative model basically describes the transition from one state to another state as a function of instrumental actions and Pavlovian stimuli. And that's been, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in an overview way, the uh, value-based framework. In an active inference framework, the decision-making situation is characterized as an inference problem. That is, the individual is trying to bring observations in agreement with the true state of the world by selecting actions that result in a homeostatic adaptation. A key difference between the value-based framework and an active inference framework is that actions are the results of two possibly competing objectives. The first is to select actions that are consistent with observations that are preferred. And the second is to select actions that provide more information about the true state of the world. These processes are often framed within what's called a Bayesian partially observable mark of decision process, which means that an individual has some prior expectation about the state of the world, that there are transition matrices that map the observation to internal states, as well as uh, mapping past states to future states. And there are preferences for observations and action policies that influence the transition from one state to the next. And I will give examples uh, of that in, uh, in some of the upcoming slides. It, for example, uh, a socially anxious individual, the internal state of being affiliated or alone, which is not observable, observable is, a, uh, is associated with the observation of talking or being silent, say, which is observable. The individual has action policies consisting of either approach or avoidance um, to change that internal state over time. Underlying the action policy is the free energy principle, which minimizes the difference between what's expected and observed and the amount of surprise associated with making an observation. As it relates to avoidance or uh, aversion-based decision-making, a decision policy that aims to minimize the aversive state is most consistent uh, uh, with, say, what we call normally uh, negative reinforcement. Reviewing the literature, as summarized in this paper below, within the value-based framework, anxiety has been associated with um, altered sensitivity to reward and punishment, slower updates to aversive prediction error, overwhelming uh, Pavlovian biases, and altered value reference points. Within the active inference framework, Anxiety-related processing dysfunctions have been related to habitual predictions that are computationally less effortful, excessive response cost, and altered beliefs about state observation relationships. However, it's important to point out that this field is still in its infancy and much work still needs to be done. And just to speak to that, there was just a recent paper that was just published a couple of weeks ago by Ray Dolan's group. And so here's an example that uh, uses an aversive framework to show that learning rates differed as a function of cognitive versus somatic anxiety. Importantly, these uh, differences emerged more strongly after recasting anxiety symptoms within a novel latent variable framework. This and other results points to future work that needs to uh, better relate symptomatic assessment with computational process uh, dysfunction to more closely connect symptom level to behavioral uh, uh, dysfunction. So let me now talk a little bit about some of the computational process dysfunction we have focused on uh, here at uh, LIBOR. Uh, 
The data presentations that will follow are based on uh, a study that we initiated uh, at LIBA about five years ago. The goal of this study uh, was uh, to model it based on a previous NIMH R01 uh, grant that was focused on latent variables uh, um, of the positive and uh, negative valence domain. But to scale it up significantly, to be able to do rigorous hypothesis testing using both an exploratory and a confirmatory sample. Briefly, we recruited 1,000 subjects with positive and negative valence domain dysfunction as measured by uh, the PHQ-9 OASIS. And uh, uh, these individuals underwent extensive assessment ranging from genotyping to social determinants of mental health including a two-hour multimodal neuroimaging session with simultaneous fMRI and EEG, which was supervised by our uh, 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 physicist, uh, Yeji Padopra. The aims were to discover latent variables underlying positive, negative valence domain and interception that could be used to relate variables across levels of analysis and to then utilize predictive models to determine the longitudinal trajectory of symptoms and function in these, in, in these individuals which could lead to clinically meaningful prediction. We also split the sample into the first and second 500, whereas the first 500 are used for exploratory data analyses and exploratory hypotheses. The second 500 will only be used for registered reports based on prior hypotheses. And so we're currently in the process of making the first 500 publicly available to other researchers. So the first study I want to uh, talk about was led by Dr. Jonathan Howlett at UCSD and used a combined value-based choice model and a drift diffusion model um, to, uh, uh, to assess decisional process dysfunction in individuals with high anxiety. So uh, uh, by way of background, surprising events are important sources of internal model updating which adjust expectations of how we perceive available options and select among them. Based on uh, previous work, we hypothesized that anxious individuals experience exaggerated surprise to predictable events, which imbues them with undue salience. So therefore, we applied a hybrid riscola wagner drift diffusion model to a change point detection task in a transdiagnostic group uh, of individuals with mood and anxiety disorder. So here's our, um, uh, our change point detection task. I, want, I don't want to go too much into detail. It's quite uh, uh, it, it extensive, but it involves multiple stage decision making where an individual has to find the patch that is uh, most often uh, reinforced. And then this patch changes about every 30 uh, trials. And uh, so, to model the behavior that an individual expresses during this task, we use the following model approach. The model assumes that expectations regarding the target loca location, so one of those three spots, influences both the initial location of the choice on a trial and the response and reaction time to the random dot stimulus. So if you're very certain about it, you'll be faster and you'll be more likely to select the quote unquote correct or most reinforced uh, uh, um, uh, patch. The dynamics of the model, that is the updating of location expectations based, based on a true target uh, location on each trial was modeled with the riscola wagner model. That is the degree of surprise of the value observed versus the value expected, uh, expected drives the updating. Subsequently, the expectation influenced either the drift diffusion bias parameter, the drift diffusion rate parameter, or both. Um, and this approach takes advantage uh, of both the choice as well as uh, on the response time of the choice. Uh, we performed uh, model comparisons of six uh, different models that are listed here. Um, all models were used to predict both the categorical location of the choices and the random dot reaction times. What's important to note here, to determine the relationship between fear and model parameters, we constructed a hierarchical model with, in which both subject level learning rates depend on uh, a scaled age, gender, and the variable we cared most about, which is the panosphere measurement. To determine whether the relationship between model parameters and fear was being driven by general negative affect, 
We also constructed a model where we included uh, uh, PANAS negative affect um, on, as an individual level predictor. Finally, you supplement our hypothesis-driven uh, 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 hypothesis analysis, uh, the uh, relationship between perceptual learning rate and fear. We also assess the relationship between the model parameters and higher level affect dimension. Um, and we included uh, other PANAS uh, domains. The model comparison uh, using the widely applicable uh, information uh, criteria, or WAIC, indicated that the uh, uh, bias and drift diffuse, uh, drift dual alpha model provided the best fit uh, for the data. Individual reported, who reported the highest fear scores showed the lowest rate of perceptual updating. In addition, older individuals uh, showed slower updating, but not decisional updating. For the decision uh, learning rate, the median ICC was uh, 0.62, which is actually uh, quite good. And for the perceptional learning rate, the median ICC was 0.8, which is excellent, which again tells us that these are sufficiently stable that we may be able to use this approach in a, uh, in a longitudinal design. So from this study, we could we can conclude that uh, anxious and older individuals showed slower updating of the internal model that influences perceptual processing, but not the model that influences decision making. Um, the two models employ separate updating processes, the separate learning rate, um, which are only weakly correlated. And taken together, anxious individuals in this context have difficulty updating the expectation relate to perceptual circuits rather than those related to decision-making circuits. We then also conducted a study, uh, again with Jonathan, that focused on, uh, on the motor control aspect. And uh, so by a way of background, in pursuing goals, we must continuously make adjustments based on errors. That is the difference between what we are, uh, where we are and where we would like to be. The adjustment must be based not only on the current situation, that is the current error, but also on how we expect this uh, situation to evolve, which is the anticipated future error. The development of techniques to solve this problem was a major success in automated control in, in, of industrial processes and resulted in what's called the uh, proportional integrated differential controller model. Um, so individuals must solve an equivalent problem when pursuing real-time control of goal-directed motor actions. And the deficit in this fundamental process could be related not only to gross abnormality of motor systems, but also to higher level cognitive and affective dysfunctions. Um, for example, we know from prior studies uh, conducted by Michael Browning that individuals with high trade anxiety were found to have difficulty selecting optimum actions when adjusting to the temporal statistics of, of the environment. Therefore, in this study, we used a simple motor task with a proportional differential controller model and a hierarchical statistical approach to determine the effect of fear and negative affect on motor control. So here, just to uh, show you what we did, um, the subject performed a simulated one-dimensional driving task. The position of a virtual car was controlled with a uh, gaming joystick, and each uh, uh, subject completed uh, 30 trials. During each trial, subjects were instructed to drive the car as quickly as possible to a stop sign and as close as possible to the stop sign without crossing the stop line. Each trial has a fixed duration of 10 seconds. The car was controlled according to a linear dynamical system. Um, that is, the car velocity was proportional to a, joy dis a joystick displacement. Throughout each trial, continuous joystick displacement was recorded with a sample window of uh, 60 per second. At each time point, uh, an error is calculated by subtracting the current position from the goal position. Uh, the control action, that is the acceleration at each time point, is a, a linear combination of the current error and a derivative of the error with coefficients kp and kd uh, respectively. Goal state is taken to be the final position of the car at the end of the trial. The goal state, the current position, and the accelerations are directly measured during the task, whereas the current error and the derivative of the current error are calculated based on those quantities. And the parameters, kp and kd, 
um, are determined based on a hierarchical model fitting process similar to what I showed you just a couple of slides ago. So uh, this basically recaptures the hierarchical uh, 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 model. The shaded circles here represent data and non-shaded uh, uh, circles uh, represent the parameters. Without going into uh, too much details, this really allows us to explicitly, sensitively, and robustly estimate model parameters. Uh, the PANIS fear score was associated with lower KB and lower KD. This indicates that those individuals with greater levels of fear weighted uh, the current error uh, and also the rate of change of that error less, which is consistent with a reduced approach behavior and a greater propensity for oscillatory behavior once the goal state is reached. In addition, we also found that males and younger uh, participants uh, uh, were associated with greater KP, indicating greater approach behavior. The effects were observed even after controlling for negative affective in general. Moreover, um, those individuals with larger um, uh, caudate and uh, without a, caudate, a caudal ACC volume also showed greater uh, differential error. The advantage of the present approach uh, includes a simple data collection procedure a hierarchical model fitting approach yielding highly reliable model parameters. And our generative model specifically predicts acceleration at each time point and during each trial and reliably captured individual behavioral differences uh, performing the task. The model parameters demonstrate a relationship to self-report and demonstrate a, a link to some uh, uh, imaging derived parameters. And we're now in the process of actually uh, going further with this model. So we conclude from this study is uh, using a proportion uh, derivative control framework, we can parse altered error control in, anxiety, in individuals with anxiety related problems. Anxious individuals underestimate the error of current motor actions consistent with increased inhibition. Anxious individuals also underestimate the rate of change of the error, which, is, uh, which results in oscillatory behavior. These parameters have direct relevance uh, for uh, treatment targets uh, in behavioral interventions. And that's something that we're very much in interested in, that we can now target these, um, for example, by uh, using uh, uh, neuromodulation approaches. The next example is the example that was done together with uh, Ryan Smith and Robin Opperley here at LIBOR. And it's basically on the notion that imbalances in the decision to approach or avoid, when both positive and negative consequences are expected, is often problematic in uh, people with mental health uh, problems. For example, people with depression and anxiety may choose to sacrifice participation in rewarding activities because they believe that such activities will also lead to negative consequences. So several par paradigms are used to study this approach avoidance conflict, most of which create a conflict between receiving monetary reward and, and uh, monetary punishments or pain or some other stimulus. Using a computational modeling approach allows one to precisely quantify the distinct information processing mechanisms that contribute to decision making. Uh, um, and so in this study, we applied an active inference approach of computational modeling um, to an affect based conflict with the goal to separate two uh, underlying uh, components, uh, decision uncertainty and relative sensitivity to negative affective uh, stimuli versus reward, which we termed emotional conflict. Here's the uh, approach avoidance conflict task that was developed by uh, Robin Opperly. And without going too much into uh, detail about uh, the task, the essence here is that an individual ex uh, uh, indicates his or her preferences of whether to experience a positive and or a negative event. And that based on this preference, we can um, infer what are the decision processes that drive the approach avoidance conflict. And specifically, to model the approach avoidance conflict task, we, adopt, we adopted again a mark of decision process model within the active inference framework. We chose this model because it's well suited for modeling decision making under uncertainty and was designed to model inference and planning processes both with and without learning. Because the outcomes of, uh, of decisions in the AAC task were probabilistic, uh, 
and participants were explicitly informed about these probabilities when making choices, a model that explicitly incorporated action outcome probabilities appeared to be the most appropriate in this particular incident. Um, so the approach uh, here re uh, required that uh, we specify the relationship, again, between observation and hidden states, uh, the relationship between current and previous states, the prior preference of the individual, and uh, this leaves us with two free parameters, as uh, I pointed out before, decision uncertainty and emotional conflict. Here's uh, uh, briefly the population. Because of the heterogeneous nature of the population, we create actually two samples. And uh, uh, in, the, uh, in particular, we created a propensity match sample um, to see whether these effects was independent on, of age and um, general cognitive abilities as measured by the WART scores. Here are the results. In this graph, we show both the average, which is the bar graphs on the bottom, as well as the parameter distribution to better delineate the individual model variability. Individuals with depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders in the, on this paradigm showed greater uncertainty in decision-making uh, relative to healthy controls. We also found that individuals with substance use disorder tended to show lower emotional uh, 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 conflict. Not notably, emotional, uh, uh, we found that averaging across participants, the model was very accurate in predicting behavior in 72% of the trials, in fact. Emotional conflict correlated more strongly with self-reported motivation. So for example, the motivation towards reward, the, mo uh, the move away from uh, negative outcomes and higher uh, self-reported uh, anxiety during the task. Decision uncertainty correlated more strongly with self-reported difficulty uh, making decisions on this task and with reduced motivation uh, towards uh, reward. So from this study, we can conclude that First of all, the model accurately uh, predicted the behavior. The parameter estimate showed strong relationship with uh, both uh, reaction times and the patient self-reported feelings and motivations during the task. Emotional conflict was uniquely associated with self-reported anxiety on this task, and decision uncertainty was uniquely associated with self-reported difficulty making decisions on this task. Uh, what's important is that both uh, parameters were not highly correlated, and showed distinct relationship with psychopathology. So based on these uh, few studies that I showed, and we've got many more that are in process, we can say that computational process dis uh, dysfunction and anxiety are characterized by the following. First, these individuals have difficulty updating perceptual processes that are uh, uh, relative to decision processes during a change point detection task. These individuals also have attenuated error processing of current motor actions consistent with increased inhibition during motor control. And at the same time, they underestimate the rate of change of the error, which results in oscillatory behavior during this motor control task. They show exaggerated decision uncertainty in an approach avoidance, uh, avoidance task. These process dysfunctions are clearly transdiagnostic. Um, they can be readily assessed with behavioral paradigms. They're associated with distinct neural circuits, although I haven't shown you some of these data yet, um, and can be used to develop uh, specific circuit-based uh, interventions. So lastly, I want to talk a little about uh, sort of a probatic approach uh, uh, to computational psychiatry. So far, the primary goal has been to develop explanatory disease models based on computational dysfunctions and anxiety. Here, I would like to briefly talk about the possibility of using computational models to develop novel assessments that can be used to make individual level predictions. So that's more on the pragmatic side. Again, this work was done in collaboration uh, with Ryan Smith here uh, at LIBOR. So this was uh, essentially a project that was based on the study we conducted at LIBOR to examine the ability using pharmacological modulation to increase adherence. Although I will actually not talk about the study, I will emphasize here the computational approaches towards devel developing a better understanding of non-adherence and to pragmatically develop novel assessment to predict non-adherence. So um, just by way of background, 
Adherence is one of the most important public uh, medical problems based on the assessment by the WHO. Non-adherence is associated with approximately $300 billion uh, annual healthcare costs. Non-adherence has profound impact on re reimbursements to payers and reductions in the so-called star ratings. It is estimated that about 125,000 deaths annually are attributable to non-adherence. Medication adherence is a complex behavior which involves multiple steps, such as making an appointment, accepting a script, filling a script, taking medication as prescribed, maintain supply, and return to the provider. And what's uh, important to understand, 25% of all patients who get a script don't even fill the script. Here is a large a study that was conducted to show the adherence patterns, um, uh, which is consistent with many other studies that have been uh, uh, conducted in this field. It shows a typical pattern of adherence that after initiation, uh, after initiation of antidepressant treatment. After a sharp decline in adherence, only half continue an antidepressant uh, therapy beyond the minimum recommended duration of six months. This graph shows an illustration of the Markov decision process formulation of active inference used in these simulations. The generative model depicted here show that errors indicate dependencies between different variables. As uh, described previously, observation depend on hidden states. Uh, where this relation is specific, uh, uh, specified by what's called the A matrix. Uh, and those states depend uh, on previous states uh, with a transition matrix uh, uh, called the B matrix. And then that these uh, uh, transitions are influenced by uh, a, a set of policies and actions which are characterized by uh, another set of uh, uh, parameters. Um, the probability of selecting a particular uh, policy in turn depends on the expected free energy uh, of each policy with respect to the prior preferences of the simulated uh, patient. The degree to which the expected free energy influences the policy is also modulated uh, by an expected policy uh, position uh, parameter in this uh, uh, model called G, which in turn depends on, on the prior expectation um, over the expected uh, precision. Um, where higher B values promote lower confidence in policy, policy selection. Finally, the E vector is a prior distribution of the policies, uh, which also influences the policy selection, can be thought of as encoding uh, the patient's habits. This graph shows uh, in more detail a hidden two-state uh, uh, factor model um, they, uh, that characterizes both uh, the symptom predictability as well as the expected uh, policy uh, precision. Um, and then we basically move the, uh, uh, the uh, agent along a severity uh, rate on both uh, symptom severity and side effect. And uh, we base these transitions on uh, empirical data that have been obtained by large scale meta-analyses. Um, we then conducted several different simulations and I'm only gonna briefly describe uh, we have a basic simulation under what circumstances will the individual engage in continued adherence, at what circumstances do you find um, expectation-based non-adherence, and also surprise-based uh, non-adherence. So after conducting a whole set of these simulations, uh, we basically ended up uh, with a model-based adherence questionnaire. And we developed the simple questionnaire that contained a number of example self-reported items that based on our model could be useful for gathering information about the patient's adherence uh, relevant beliefs. And the idea is that uh, um, we are particularly focused on uh, uh, certainty and expectation about medication uh, outcomes and uh, the action that the, that the individual chooses to adhere. Uh, the next steps here is to use this questionnaire to validate it, to apply it to intervention study and to refine the adherence model now based actually on real data. Ultimately, the goal here is individual level uh, adherence prediction. So this is an example where we can use active interference modeling to identify patterns of decision-making that contribute to non-adherence to medication. Um, and uh, uh, here are three uh, examples of when that can happen.
These simulations can help to develop new probes to determine sources of non-adherence, and thus computational models and simulations can be pragmatically useful for novel questionnaire development that can actually have a pragmatic uh, utility. So finally, my last slide, uh, the general take-home points. From my perspective, computational uh, psychiatry provides an explanatory framework to quantitatively test hypotheses how individuals with psychiatric disorders process decision-making situations differently. Can be viewed as identifying the critical parameters of the dynamical system that underlies uh, uh, the psychiatric disorder. It's a principled way to identify novel processes that can better explain observed uh, behavior, but still awaits integration with other units of analysis. That is uh, integration with molecular, uh, cellular systems and environmental factors. Finally, it can also be uh, used in a pragmatic context to make better predictions and to develop novel uh, assessment tools. With that, I wanna thank you for your attention and I'm hoping I can address some of the questions that you might've had uh, throughout uh, the talk. Maybe I can uh, give it over to Alex if you wanna sort of be the moderator. Sure, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Paulus for, for an excellent, excellent talk. Um, I want, I want to go back to a moment for, uh, to what you said at the very beginning of your talk, um, which, which is that stakeholders, um, stakeholders seek an understanding of psychiatric illness. Families, um, patients want, want to understand the, the basis to psychiatric illnesses. Um, can you touch more on the possible challenges in communicating findings from computational psychiatry with stakeholders? Um, obviously, meeting with parents and telling them that their teen's condition is etiologically complex might not go over too well. Right. No, I, I think you bring up a very, very important point. And that's actually something that I'm working very hard within the computational psychiatry community. As you can imagine, people who gravitate toward computational psychiatry um, I tend to be uh, very uh, mathematically minded and would like to express, um, uh, you know, and are expressing these process models in mathematical terms. Our job, the way I see it, is to translate uh, the, uh, these models into something that people can understand. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, let, let's say a, 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 a nice finding that uh, basically uh, Michael Browning's group um, as well as um, we find is the difficulty that anxious people have to adjust to volatile versus non-volatile environments. And, and the way to, to actually say that is that um, you might be doing well if nothing changes around you. But when things change, things, if things change around you and you don't know exactly when these things are changing, your brain has difficulty differentiating what is true change from what is just a uh, random fluctuation. Um, and what random fluctuation is like, you know, we're trying to predict, uh, 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 say, we're, we're, we're trying to predict uh, whether, uh, here's a good example. Um, if you're on the highway and you're behind a car and you're trying to basically use the car to predict whether the driver is a male or female, um, it's very clear, and people have actually tried that, that you cannot do that. It's a random uh, uh, event. So uh, the, the idea is it's very difficult. It's, it's random. You can't control that. Um, but sometimes, you know, when you, for example, take one highway over another highway, there are robust ways of saying, okay, uh, you ch should take the left versus the right highway. Um, and differentiating between do these two different problems or these two different challenges is what's difficult for anxious people. So if you put it in words, if you describe what then um, results in, in changes in the internal state, and that's sort of, again, where, the, where I, I really like the idea of the active inference uh, approach, because the active inference approach basically says, we don't really, it's really difficult for us to, to get to that internal state. We can get to that internal state only through observations. And so uh, uh, the notion here is that when you put in these situations, when you have to make a decision, um, it change, it, 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 with your particular makeup, it changes uh, your internal state and you have difficulty with that. Um, so, so 
the, the point is that we need to translate these computational uh, mathematical model into something that, uh, that people can actually practically understand. And I think that as we're developing uh, these models and as we're developing uh, different types of models, uh, we can do that and we can communicate that. I mean, it's, and, and it, the, the beauty of this is, so the client, you know, I've, I've been a psychiatrist for over 20 years. And of course, many times we talk about the serotonin dysfunction and depression and so on and so forth. And people are kind of willing to take it to some level, but it really never quite sticks because people want process uh, dysfunction. You know, they, I'm anxious because of this happened to me, or I'm doing this differently or whatever. The, it's really process-based saying that you have, too much or too little serotonin doesn't give the person something to work with. I do think that these process models give a person something to work with. Sure. Um, and, and along those lines, I mean, if we do have a computational model that is robust and the results are solid and, and we truly believe in those results, um, what, what do you think is stopping clinical adoption? Um, what can the field do? What, how, can we, how can we move this field along um, into the realm of clinical practice, into that direction? Um, and, and where do you think we currently stand on, on these models being included in, in a diagnostician's toolkit? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very, uh, right now we we're clearly living in uh, sort of a little bit of a bubble, right? The, the clinicians have sort of vaguely heard about maybe computational psychiatry, they have no idea what the, uh, uh, you know, no, but I think that, and I'm, I'm active in the uh, uh, Anxiety and Depression Association of America, ADAA, uh, where you have consumer groups, you have therapists, and you have researchers. And I think it's gonna have to come through those uh, organizations where we begin to translate that to therapists, where we basically, either through meetings, through courses, uh, through lectures, uh, provide these, uh, um, these models as frameworks of explaining uh, an individual's behavior. And then of course we need assessment because you know, we, we don't wanna just do a generic assessment, oh, you have problems with this. We want to make sure that once we have an assessment, it's you that has the problem with this, not in general anxious people. That, uh, so, so I think there are two challenges here. One is that we, want, uh, we need to have the help from organizations that link consumers and, and, and patients to researchers. And second, we need to have really robust tools that can be used in clinical practice to actually uh, uh, get real parameters from these models that then are translated back into something that can be communicated to the patient. Um, I do, we do have uh, about one more minute for questions. So if anyone has any other questions they wanna enter, um, but we do have some uh, excitement for Bayesian models. <laughs> yeah, I see um, that, and, and, and I see the I see the question that almost always comes up, and and, I, and so this is a very important question. Um, and it, it says, have you compared value-based models with active inference models, and what difference have you found? What are the advantages of the latter? So that's a it's a very good question. Um, we have, and in fact, we we are currently doing this. The problem is, and we have to be very honest, that the tasks as we currently have them uh, make it very, very difficult to uh, clearly differentiate between uh, the, the models that could generate one behavior versus another. It, it just is a fact that many of the uh, reinforcement learning models uh, show very similar behavior to uh, the active inference models. But I think what is important is, um, and, and the difference is, of course, that in the active inference model, you are not just paying attention to what's, what you like and dislike, the preferences, right, which is one element, but you also pay attention to wanting to know more about the world at large because it could help you ultimately to better adapt to it. Um, and so what we're currently doing is trying to develop tasks where really doing this exploratory, oh, let me see what's over here. Um, uh, 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 it, developing these tasks so that we can say, okay, if you don't have that point, if you don't have that looking out for what might be around the corner, so it can be better, um, you're doing, you, your behavior is different. Uh, and, uh, and that's, it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult problem uh, to really clearly uh, uh, disambiguate these two models. Thank you. I think uh, Josh will wrap us up now. <laughs>
Yeah, actually, I have a real quick question first uh, that sure. I thought about, uh, and then I'll wrap it up. So, so Martin, you, you mentioned sort of towards the beginning that test retest uh, reliability is going to be really important. So do some of these, do, 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 do the active inference versus the uh, reward-based learning models do better at, at, at test retest reliability? We, do we have the data yet? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, we're actually looking at this. We actually just uh, looked at the test retest set. It does appear that we get very uh, good test retest reliability with the particular model that we've instantiated here. I'm very excited about the motor control model. The motor control model is very stable. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's, it, it uses a, a, an error-based framework, uh, but because it has, it looks at trajectories, it has many more data points um, uh, by which to arbitrate the, the model parameters. So, um, so we may end up with uh, even a different set of uh, computational models that, that, that have higher test retest re uh, uh, reliability. The problem fundamentally is the following. Any learning model, almost any learning model that is based on probabilistic reinforcement um, is, has difficulty with test retest. And it's a very simple thing. If you think about it yourself, the first time you do a task that is um, randomly reinforced, you are possibly um, processing it within a probabilistic framework. But once you know about the structure of the task, oftentimes what happens, heuristics take over. So you have some rules. Okay, yeah, if I see, uh, if I see the dot three times on the left, I'm going to do the left uh, uh, choice or whatever. Not. And so then you basically transition to a different type of behavior. And it's understandable that the models that, uh, uh, that instantiate the first uh, behavior are different than the models that instantiate the second behavior. That's fundamentally the problem that we're facing. So we have to find uh, uh, behavioral probes that we, can apply, uh, that we can combine with computational models that, that, that are not afflicted by that problem. All right. Well, thank you. You've given uh, us a lot of wonderful examples of uh, really um, seemingly complex models, but that boil down to simple concepts. And you've made the attempt, I think, and uh, forcefully so, uh, you made the case forcefully so that you can actually describe them in ways that, that, that make sense from the perspective of thinking about psychopathology. I think it'll be really interesting to see how well these models, as you hinted at, map onto neural processes and, uh, and how well they can be utilized to uh, not just improve our understanding of what's going on, but also develop novel treatments. Thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, Thank for you. Thanks talking. for having me. I hope to, uh, hope to go out on the bike with you soon. <laughs> okay, me too. <laughs> and thanks, everybody, for attending. Bye-bye for now, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.